Okay. So, the le my lecture is about uh, surgical treatment of lung cancer. Of course, I'm going to talk about lung cancer first, uh, a little bit uh, etiology, epidemiology, and then uh, we will dive into the surgical treatment and the modalities of surgical treatment. So I want to uh, start with the case, a uh, 75 year old male, he was admitted with chest pain, cough, cigarette smoking. Uh, he, he, he was a cigarette smoker. He smoked a 25 pack year of cigarette. In October, 2010, he uh, underwent a prostate uh, uh, operation, prostatectomy. And he also had undergone subtotal gastrectomy in 1973. He also had a cholecystectomy in 2008, which are in irrelevant with this situation with the lung cancer. So chest uh, 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 radiograph showed a uh, uh, irregular uh, 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 right, right lower lobe tumor with irregular shape, as you see here. So in a smoker patient uh, who uh, is uh, 75 years old, uh, first thing we should, uh, we should suspect is uh, should be actually lung cancer in this patient. Of course, this lesion, this mass uh, could be um, many uh, pathologies, including uh, organizing pneumonia, fibroma, meningioma, lymphoma, or some kind of uh, lesions uh, that can be caused by uh, some inflammatory diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus. But in this patient, uh, the most probable diagnosis should be lung cancer. Of course, uh, a chest CT uh, was taken in this patient and chest CT clearly shows uh, approximately four centimeter uh, mass uh, located in the right lower lobe, as you see here. And you see, uh, the, uh, you see that the uh, borders are very irregular there are some speculated uh, speculations around the mass. So PET-CT shows the metabolic activity of the lesion, and it shows clearly that the tumor, the lesion, is metabolically active. Uh, it is very, very active. It means that uh, the cells in this lesion uh, actually uptake uh, glucose, radioactive glucose, very intensely. Of course, this doesn't mean this SUV uptake uh, doesn't mean that this uh, lesion is tumor. But as I said before, uh, the most probable uh, cause is tumor. Of course, this could be a uh, inflammatory uh, uh, lesion or uh, some kind of a benign lesion. Uh, but most benign lesions in most benign lesions, SUV uptake is uh, expected to be lower than this. So uh, PET-CT also shows no systemic metastasis and we uh, performed transthoracic needle aspiration and we have uh, seen that the lesion uh, was non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, cranial MRI showed no metastasis and we performed mediastinoscopy for the possible involvement of the pretracheal lymph nodes. And also we performed a right lower lobectomy in this patient because this tumor was operable and we performed also systematic mediastinal lymph node dissection, which is uh, indispensable in the patients with epithelial tumors. I mean, uh, all, almost always a, medi a lymph node dissection should be added to the a resection of an epithelial tumor. So uh, since uh, the um, uh, lung tumor is an epithelial tumor, systematic mediastinal lymph node dissection is a must, not a choice. Uh, uh, irrelevant to this disease, we also performed a right upper lobe wedge resection for the bullia because this patient was a, a heavy smoker and uh, it is very normal to, to see a bullia or bleb uh, in a smoker patient, for this reason, we resected bullea in addition to lobectomy. 
So a pathological uh, examination showed a squamous cell carcinoma in this patient. Of course, I am not a pathologist and I don't want to uh, talk about the pathological features of this uh, slide, but you can clearly see that these tumors are chaotic and uh, the uh, basal membrane is not respected. The basal membrane, as you see, is clearly invaded by the tumor cells. So in order to give you a perspective, I want to sh uh, share uh, a, a right upper lobectomy, not that patient's operation. This is uh, right upper lobectomy uh, procedure. Firstly, we uh, uh, dissect the uh, upper lobe vein, which is superior uh, pulmonary vein. This is superior pulmonary vein, as you see here, uh, because in order to resect the uh, lobe, we have to dissect the vein, artery, and the bronchus, uh, because th these are the higher structures. So this is pulmonary vein, upper pulmonary vein. This is a leaf node around the hilum, which is number 10. I, I'm going to talk about the numbers of the mediastinal and the hilum leaf nodes. This is stapler. Uh, it dissects out, the, it cuts the uh, pulmonary vein, as you see here. And then uh, we uh, began to, uh, to isolate, to find the uh, uh, upper lobe uh, arteries, arterial branches. This is one of the arterial branches. This is uh, again number 11 interlobar uh, uh, leaf node. This is one of the, the arterial branches, which is called anterior truncus because it is the main uh, arterial branch of the right upper lobe. So after this uh, procedure, we put the stapler just behind the arter arterial branch. So it cuts it. Because this is an endoscopic operation, we have to perform uh, the uh, ligations and the dissection with uh, some of the specific uh, uh, instruments such as uh, staplers. And this is a clip. This is a, uh, a polymer clip, so we, we, which is very safe to, to apply uh, to the arterial br uh, branch. So this is upper lobe bronchus here. This is upper lobe bronchus. Right now, I am dissecting the upper lobe bronchus. This is upper lobe bronchus. And then we put the tape just be behind the upper lobe bronchus. And then we close the bronchus in order to be sure that this is uh, upper lobe bronchus. After uh, being sure that this is upper lobe bronchus, we cut the upper lobe bronchus with the staplers, specifically designed dedicated stapler, which is, as you see, green load. So after that, there is one more uh, arterial branch which is called uh, posterior ascending branch of the upper lobe. Uh, this is clipped here, as you see. And then this is energy device, which is, which is used for the coagulation. And uh, sorry, coagulation. Sorry about that. So I'm going to show you th that uh, video after uh, one, one hour after this slide. So. Let's look at the cancer statistics. So I have to tell that if you have any questions, please uh, tell me, you can interrupt me and you can ask your questions. So according to latest statistics, as you see, uh, the most common uh, tumor in men, this is uh, statistics from United States, is prostate. And the, the most common tumor in women is breast, as you see here. But we, when you look at the, uh, the mortality figures, there is a different story. As you see here, uh, in terms of mortality uh, due to tumors, uh, lung tumor, lung tumor comes first in men and women. As actually, uh, approximately one quarter of uh, people who had tumor. Uh, die from lung cancer, as you see here. This is because the, the mortality of lung cancer is so high.
Let's look at the uh, survival curve of mammary carcinoma. As you see here, uh, approximately 61 out of 100 patients with mammary carcinoma can survive beyond 10 years. But it is different, as I told you, for lung cancer. The 10-year survival rate is only about 7%. This, is, this figure is for all uh, stages of tumors. This is uh, the survival uh, curves uh, are a, a little bit different for operable patients, but you can see that the survival rate is very low, very dismal in lung cancer. This is why lung cancer is the number one mortality cause uh, in Western world. So of course, cigarette smoking is very, very important in terms of the genesis of the lung cancer. This, is, uh, this graph is from United Kingdom. As you see here, uh, the male lung cancer death rate uh, very nicely follows the cigarette consumption per capita. So when it is, it is decreased, the proportion of the cigarette smoking decreased, the death rate uh, follows the uh, proportion of cigarettes consumption uh, uh, it follows it, but there is a 10 years lag between two uh, curves because it takes at least 10 years to see a decrease in lung cancer uh, incidence uh, when you uh, decrease the proportion of cigarette consumption. What about the uh, situation in Turkey? Actually, Tur in Turkey, uh, lung and bronchus tumors, uh, actually, we should say lung tumor because bronchus tumor is a very old uh, definition. Uh, so we should say lung tumor or pulmonary tumor. So this is the, uh, the most common uh, tumor in, in men, uh, higher than the prostate tumor, as you see here, because of the probably high proportion of cigarette smoking in, in our population. And unfortunately, it, it is increasing. And unfortunately, uh, I, I hope that I am, I am wrong, but uh, during this pandemic, the uh, proportion of cigarette smoking, I think is, it is increasing. So of course, uh, there, there was a time uh, in which uh, uh, cigarette, cigarette, companies, cigarette companies used uh, women uh, and even children to promote cigarette smoking. Uh, this is one of them. And this is a clip from uh, one show, uh, Young, uh, yeah, here. Here, that's my mom. <laughs> yeah, the little queen of darkness. She's smoking a cigarette? Yep, probably stole it from me. Why did she stop being cool? Well, first of all, smoking is not cool. You do it? Yeah, well, next time I'm hocking up some black goo in my line, I'll call you over and you can see how cool it is. Awesome. It is not awesome. And as far as your mom, I think things are to turn around for her when she gave birth to you. Okay, so first of all, it shouldn't be cool among women, but unfortunately it is right now cool among women to smoke cigarette in Turkey. So when you look at, when you come to, uh, uh, to the hospital again, uh, please look at some uh, sequestrated places, very uh, uh, discreet pl places around a hospital. Uh, for example, there is a, uh, there is a door of uh, IC unit uh, down there uh, from in, in this building, the surgical building. You can see many women, uh, actually uh, nurses and uh, uh, female doctors who smoke. Actually, I think it is increasing among women. And it was the case in Japan uh, just after World War II. Actually, before uh, World War II, it was very, uh, it was uh, uh, socially unacceptable uh, to see a woman uh, smoking cigarette in Japan because Japan, uh, like Turkey, is a very male dominated country. Uh, before World War II, uh, women uh, didn't smoke actually. But after the invasion of uh, United States, after World War II, be, uh, Japanese women began to see uh, American films in, in which the protagonist women uh, smoke 
uh, cigarette very uh, in a cool way. And they began to uh, smoke cigarettes. But unlike Turkey, uh, Japanese uh, population is very self-disciplinized uh, population. And uh, they uh, realize that the cigarette smoking is bad for health for in terms of many diseases. And they is, began to quit cigarette smoking. Today, uh, Japanese women uh, uh, have the, one of the lowest uh, lung cancer uh, incidences in the world. Even they use uh, doctors to promote cigarette smoking here. This is one of the uh, advertisement used by uh, Japanese cigarette companies just after World War II. So there is a, this is like a cultural uh, chaos, as you see here, Murat, the Turkish cigarette, as you see, they use Santa Claus. So uh, is, isn't there a, a good news? Yes, there is a good news. Actually, survival in lung cancer is slightly improving. Uh, just remember the 10 year survival rate, which was about 7%. Uh, this is five year survival. It is uh, slightly improving. Uh, it uh, got to 18% from 12% in 1970s. But uh, uh, in, in the same time, this slide shows uh, that the, the lung cancer survival rate is one of the lowest uh, survival rates uh, of the tumors, as you see, uh, it is like esophagus, which esophagus improved uh, very much uh, during last decades. Also, it is like intrahepatic bile duct cancers. So what should we uh, expect to see? This is a very is typical chest radiograph in a patient with lung cancer, as you see, this patient has a uh, right, left upper lobe tumor, which is this uh, mass is irregular in shape and it obscures the, uh, the density of the lung. Uh, and you cannot see the, the parenchyma behind the tumor. So this is very typical for lung cancer. This patient uh, had a hyalur tumor just around the uh, right uh, main bronchus, as you see. There are, it comes from very different shapes and uh, sizes, as you see. This is a, a lung cancer, uh, which was resected with the lobe. It seems like this, where you can see the features of the lung cancer, uh, which, is, which are the features of any tumor. This is chaotic, and these cells uh, only proliferate, and they uh, don't know any limit. So tobacco smoking is the major uh, risk factor, as you know, but there are other environmental factors, including asbestos, arsenic, industrial materials, radon, secondhand smoking, and genetic predisposition, of course, but uh, it comprises very small number of patients with lung cancer. So this is why it is called uh, bronchus cancer. It, it used to be called actually bronchus cancer because uh, in some patients, uh, the tumor arises from bronchus or in bronchus, as you see here. Uh, what about the uh, incidence of lung cancer in the world? Actually, there is one place in the world in which the proportion of cigarette smoking is very low, which is sub-Saharan Africa, as you see here. Uh, since tobacco comes from, actually came from uh, America, uh, in African people actually don't smoke. Uh, uh, they have not been smoking actually for hundreds of years. This is why the incidence in uh, men and women, uh, the proportion of cigarette smoking uh, also are low in these areas. But other areas, uh, it is very high. So this is, these are the compounds uh, in the uh, cigarette smoker, smoking, uh, smoke actually. At least there are 70 uh, carcinogens which have been uh, proven to be uh, causes of uh, lung cancer, as you see here. And uh, among them, benzoprene is the characteristic one. Of course, it causes uh, DNA uh, uh, breakage, as you see here, damage. And uh, DNA damage means mutation. 
some of the mutations uh, can cause lung cancer, as you see here. Uh, there are some uh, oncogenes and anti-oncogenes, including EGFR, BRAF, ALK, uh, uh, protein uh, 3 kinases. Uh, P53 is uh, the most common uh, uh, anti-oncogene, mutated anti-oncogene. When, when it is normal, it is called TP53. Uh, the role of TP53 is, as you know, to uh, pause the cell cycle in order to give uh, some time to, to cell to, uh, to, man, to fix the DNA. Without it, with a mutated uh, P53, the DNA mutation rate is so high in these cells. And also EGFR is mutated in at approximately 20% of the patients with adenocarcinoma. EGFR plays a role like a switch, on-off switch for the cell. When it is mutated, it sends a proliferation signals to the cell continuously without uh, the, the need for the presence of EGF, which is epithelial growth factor. So uh, the question sh could be, does tumor, do, do, do tumors uh, become tumor, tumors instantaneously? The, quest, the, the answer is no. There, it is a, a very uh, continuous process. It is an ongoing process. And it, it takes more than one uh, uh, oncogenes. There should be many oncogenes uh, which, are, which should be activated uh, in one uh, tumor. But the tumor uh, arises as a one cell. It is, a call, it is called a monoclonality theory. But uh, because of the many genetic disturbances, uh, namely, microsatellite instability, we deal, as clinicians, we deal with many types of tumors. Every tumor, every tumor cells are different in one uh, mass of tumor. This is why it is very, very difficult to cure this tumor with chemotherapy. Tumor uh, actually begins, at, uh, begins as an uh, in situ tumor and microinvasion makes it very dangerous. With microinvasion, it can cause metastasis, as you see here, uh, because the tumors can reach the intravascular space and then they metastasize from there. There are two kinds of clinical picture of uh, lung cancer. Uh, one uh, pathway, one clinical pathway is related to tobacco smoking. So these tumors usually tend to be squamous cell tumors and small cell uh, tumors, and they tend to be higher usually. But adenocarcinomas uh, uh, actually tend to be peripheral, as you see here. Uh, uh, despite the fact that these are different clinical pictures, the, uh, uh, the biological behavior, uh, behaviors are very similar. So they tend to metastasize. They tend to uh, metastasize to the brain, to the uh, bones, to the liver, and to any other parts of body. This is why it is lethal. The lung cancer is so lethal. So what about pathology? Uh, in Turkey, actually, uh, adenocarcinoma is increasing, but it is about, uh, around 40%. In Western countries, it is about 80 or 70%. Non small cell lung cancer is the uh, actually usually uh, the the, uh, the eighty percent of the tumors are non small cell lung cancer and uh, we can operate uh, some uh, proportion of the non small cell lung cancer patients, but usually uh, small cell lung carcinoma are carcinomas are presented with multiple metastases with very large higher tumors. This is why we don't usually operate. There are some exceptions about that. We don't, we cannot uh, operate the small cell lung carcinoma patients because of the extensive stage. Approximately one out of seven uh, patients with lung cancer can be operable, can be found operable. Uh, what about the symptoms? Actually, 
in most patients, there, there are no symptoms actually. And uh, most patients uh, have difficulty to believe the doctor that they have tumor. They, they usually tend to say, okay, doctor, you say that there is a mass in my lung or in my thorax, but I don't feel anything. Are you sure that I, am, I have a tumor? We usually say to them, if there is a uh, 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 proven cytology, yes, you have a tumor, unfortunately, and you can be operated. But uh, some patients, not very small number of patients, some patients, approximately one third of patients don't believe us and they uh, uh, go and use some kind of uh, non-effective treatment. For example, this patient, unfortunately, had oil treatment and he, she came back to me with a non-operable tumor uh, six months after the uh, diagnosis. There are, of course, symptoms uh, that can be caused by tumors, uh, bronchopulmonary symptoms, uh, such as cough, hemoptysis, wheezing, and dyspnea. But usually, uh, large tumors cause symptoms. And there are some extrapulmonary intrathoracic symptoms, such as dyspnea, dysphonia, dysphagia. And also, there are extrapulmonary extrathoracic symptoms, such as metabolic symptoms, as you see here, neuromuscular symptoms, like myopathy, peripheral neuropathy, supercute uh, cerebellar degeneration, skeletal symptoms, dermatological symptoms. There are many symptoms actually uh, that can be diagnosed by very careful clinician. But there are, uh, the, it, uh, these symptoms uh, can be notified in very small number of patients. There are vascular symptoms such as arterial or venous thrombosis and hematological symptoms. There are also extrathoracic metastatic symptoms such as neurological symptoms, bone pain, subcutaneous nodules. And of course, there are non-specific symptoms like tiredness, loss of appetite, weight loss, and hypothermia. Okay, how should we evaluate a patient uh, with a tumor? Of course, chest x-ray is very useful. Uh, it is cheap and it can be found in everywhere, almost uh, at any medical facility. Uh, and it shows large tumors and it shows many tumors actually. Uh, CT scan is the gold standard method for evaluation. Positron emission tomography uh, can show us the metabolic activity, metab the uh, glucose avidity of the tumor. It, uh, it shows the proliferation rate actually uh, of the cells inside the mass. But of course, it is not specific for the tumor. Magnetic resonance imaging is very rarely needed in lung cancer uh, patients because of the low uh, proton density of the lung. Because of the low proton density of the lung, the MRI is not a good uh, evaluation method, is not a good radiological uh, evaluation uh, tool for uh, lung tumors. But uh, for superior sulcus tumors, for vertebral or diaphragmatic invasion, uh, it is used and it gives us a very uh, info important uh, uh, information about the uh, about the, uh, uh, the invasion of the tumor uh, or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the structures around the tumor, if it is invaded or not. A positron emission tomography is a metabolic uh, uh, method, uh, a nuclear medicine method, as you see. Uh, usually, uh, 18F, to deoxydeglucose is used. Uh, it is a radioactive uh, molecule uh, uh, which is emitting positrons. Positrons is antimatter, uh, antimatter, and the um, matter counterpart is electron uh, for positron. It is not possible to detect positron. It can be possible. It is possible only uh, in Geneva, in some very large facilities, nuclear facilities like Geneva, like in, uh, in which there is a, a large uh, uh, cyclotron. Uh, instead of detecting positron, we have to detect gamma ray, which is uh, emitted 
by the annihilation of the positron with electron, as you see here. But there is a problem with that. Uh, uh, positron should travel approximately eight, six to eight millimeter to find an electron because atoms are so empty. 99 99.99999% of atom is empty actually. So uh, there is a halo between around the uh, lesion. When you look at the, uh, the PET CT, uh, uh, PET CT sections, as you see here, this is a tumor. These are N1, N2, and N3. These are lymph node invasions. As you see here, the, these lesions are blurred. These are uh, these uh, the, uh, the, the, these lesions uh, contain halo around that. This is not a, a low uh, resolution of the uh, the PET CT machine. This is because of the uh, uh, subatomic subatomic particle physics, uh, because of the uh, the, the travel uh, of the positron to find an electron. So anyway, uh, we can see the tumor as a high metabolic uh, activity lesion, as you see here. And it is, uh, there is a reason to uh, suspect uh, lung cancer in this patient. So what are the evaluation methods? Uh, bronchoscopy and transbronchial needle aspiration biopsy should come first especially uh, for the patients with hyalur tumors. Transthoracic needle aspiration biopsy is a good uh, method for the peripheral tumors. Mediastinal leaf node biopsy can be performed in the patients with mediastinal leaf nodes, very large mediastinal leaf nodes, mediastinoscopy or mediastinotomy. And thoracoscopy, which is a uh, thoracic contour part of laparoscopy, we don't call it thoracoscopy, the laparoscopy, we call it thoracoscopy because we uh, perform uh, 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 operation inside the thorax, not the abdomen. So, or it is called video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, that's for short. Or if the patient has a, a supraclavicular lymph node, the supraclavicular lymph node biopsy can provide a diagnosis. And what about fiber optic bronchoscopy? Fiber optic bronchoscopy is very use, use, useful method for, as I, told, as I say, uh, for the hyalur tumors uh, or subcranial uh, nodes and masses, but the sensitivity is around 50% uh, for diagnosis actually. Uh, but transthoracic needle aspiration biopsy is very uh, straightforward uh, procedure for the peripheral uh, tumors, as you see. This uh, uh, chest CT section shows a, a patient who is having transthoracic needle aspiration biopsy. This is the needle. This is, the needle is inside the tumor, as you see here. And there is, a, after the aspiration, it is very straightforward to, to provide a, a biopsy material from the tumor. So, but uh, again, this is uh, uh, a good method for peripheral tumors, not for the hyalur tumors. There is one newer method for a, a peripheral tumor biopsy, which is called electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. It is a computer-aided method to take biopsy from the peripheral nodules. Uh, it takes a very uh, 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 technologically advanced bronchoscopy systems with a uh, uh, navigation uh, 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 visibility, as you see here. And bronchoscopies can reach the tumor, uh, the peripheral tumor, with the aid of or directions of the computer, as you see here. It is very nice, uh, but also uh, it can provide 80% uh, of uh, accuracy in terms of diagnosis. Evet, buraya kadar sormak istediğiniz soru var mı?
Emin misiniz? Devam edeyim mi? Edebiliriz hocam. Yok sanırım. Peki. Okay. Uh, I'm going on the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, TNM factors actually staging for uh, for determining survival. There are many factors actually. Of course, some of them are humoral factors, T and N M, namely. But there are patient factors and there are environmental factors. Uh, these are important actually. But as clinicians, we tend to omit these environmental and patient factors. It is, these are very important actually, but we cannot uh, measure, we cannot understand these factors uh, reproducibly. Uh, we only can determine uh, these factors, TNM factors, reproducibly. Because as clinicians, we can uh, detect T, the, uh, the Uh, the size of the tumor, nodal status, and the metastasis. But it, it is very important to, rem to remember that these are other factors. So stage is a function of three parameters. T for tumor, N for node, M for metastasis. Of course, as surgeons, we have to construct the stage of the tumor in order to understand if the patient is operable or not. So we don't operate all patients. As I told you before, we can operate only one out of seven patients because these patients can uh, have beneficial effect from the surgical resection. Other patients should be directed to other uh, uh, therapeutical options such as chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy, or other uh, uh, therapeutic uh, uh, applications. So there are some kinds of uh, staging. Clinical staging is called CTNM, which is a TNM uh, before the operation, constructed by or uh, understood by the Uh, radiological or bronchoscopic evaluation. It is called CTNM. Surgical pathological staging can be constructed after the resection of the tumor. If the patient uh, has neoadjuvant therapy, why TNM should be used uh, for the tumor after the neoadjuvant therapy? This is because of this is this is because. Uh, is uh, used for restaging after initial tra treatment. Of course, there are some stages from 1A1 to 4B. So uh, as shown, uh, the operable stages are uh, 1A1, 1A2, 1A3, 1B, 2A, 2B, and some 3A patients. So I'm going to talk about these patients and these TNM factors. First, T factor. Actually, every centimeter counts according to the latest staging factor uh, from T1 to T3. I'm going to show you some examples. But before examples, I want to show you the importance of T factor. When we uh, take, sorry, when we take M0, M0 patients, it means that if the patients with no and, uh, nodal uh, involvement or uh, metastasis, uh, C, uh, T factor uh, means a lot, as you see here, because the, the early stage of patients have approximately 92% of five-year survival. Just remember the 7% of 10-year uh, survival and 18% of five-year survival. So if we diagnose the patients at a very early stage, we can almost, all, almost always completely cure a patient, as you see here. So T1A, T1B, T1C, uh, T1, T2A, T2B, as you see here. Uh, and the, these patients have 46% of five years survival. So it is, uh, again, uh, very high compared to patients, to that of patients with 
higher stages. This is uh, this shows the survival rates according to T factor at Jarapasha. This is our analysis, and uh, it it echoes the the uh, survival rates of the Lung Cancer Society, International Association for Lung Cancer, that I uh, showed you before. So, what should how can we uh, evaluate the T factor? Of course, chest CT and PET CT. Uh, I want to give you some examples of T factor. This is T1. We don't want you to remember other T factors, but please know T1 because T1 is the early stage. T1A means the tumor smaller than one centimeter. T1B uh, denotes a tumor between one and two centimeters. Uh, T1C means that the tumor is larger than two centimeter but smaller or equal to three centimeters. So as you see, T1A, T1A, T1B, and T1C are the earliest tumors. This is T, a patient with T1C, three centimeter tumor. This is right upper lobe tumor actually, because uh, the patient uh, lies uh, uh, on prone position because of the transthoracic needle aspiration procedure. But the picture is not so good in many patients. Actually, very small number of patients, unfortunately, uh, uh, come to us with T1 disease. This is T2 disease. T2 means uh, the tumor is between three centimeter and five centimeter, T2A and T2B. These tumors are operable again. T2A and T2B patients are uh, operable patients. This is T2B the tumor, uh, the diameter is about five centimeters. Again, this is a T2B tumor. In this patient, there is a uh, uh, lobe atelectasis. Lobe atelectasis uh, means T2B. So again, this is a T2B, which is very higher, uh, but it is T2B. T3 patients, T3 tumors are operable uh, again, uh, T3 means the tumor is between five and seven centimeters. And if the tumor invades the chest wall, as you see here, or parietal pleura, or there are separate tumors in one lobe, uh, it should be uh, staged as T3. But you don't have to memorize these uh, T factors, only please know T1, but uh, please know that please remember that T1 to T4 tumors are operable. So there are some uh, uh, histological evaluations of T3. So tumors can invade visceral pleura or visceral and the parietal pleura together. This is a tumor uh, invading chest wall, as you see, this is T3. We operated this patient. These are all operated patients. Again, uh, the tumor uh, is invading chest wall, as you see here, we operated this patient also. Also, this, uh, uh, there is a, a, a relatively small tumor, but it, it invades the chest wall, and also we operated this patient, and we performed lobectomy plus chest wall resection. So if the tumor invades chest wall, we do chest wall resection. What about T4 tumor? T4 tumors uh, are the tumors that are marginally resectable. Some of the T4 tumors are operable, such as the tumor invading trachea, as you see, or, uh, sorry, uh, carina or trachea or vertebra. But we don't operate the patients with aorta, uh, uh, the tumor invading aorta and esophagus. So we operate only these patients. Vena cava superior involvement is one of the T4 definition, uh, as you see. Uh, also, uh, the uh, vena cava superior involved tumors can be operable. Uh, again, tumor invading mediastinum and carina uh, is operable. Also, diaphragmatic invasion uh, is uh, again, if the, if the tumor is invading diaphragm, uh, it, it is uh, staged as T4, and again, it is operable.
this is patient is uh, a coronal involvement patient. Uh, the, the tumor uh, involves carina. And we operated this patient with coronal resection. So you can ask, actually, why do we uh, operate some T4 tumors and we don't, why don't we operate some of the tumors that are T4? The uh, answer lies in survival. Some of the patients, uh, for example, the with the tumors with, uh, invading superior sulcus carina, superior vena cava, or mediastinum, can have higher than 30% of survival when they are operated. But we know that if we uh, uh, send, if we refer the patient to oncological treatment, they have approximately 15% of survival. If we can provide higher survival than this, and also if these tumors are technically operable, we operate these patients. Of course, the nodal status should be zero. There should be no nodal status. Uh, I will talk about nodal end stage uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, but the T factor is important in terms of uh, resectability and also in terms of survival. Uh, when we operate, uh, is it possible to operate the, uh, the tumor invading aorta? Yes, it is possible with the aid of uh, cardiovascular colleagues, or it is possible to resect uh, the tumor invading esophagus. But the survival rate is about 15% uh, or low, lower than 15, 10%. So uh, the uh, operation is futile, is unnecessary in these patients. Okay, I stop here. Okay, let's look at N factor, which is very important. So this uh, graph shows the importance of N factor. Uh, actually, uh, when we look at this graph, uh, you can easily uh, understand why we uh, operate N0 and N1 patients only, because N2 and N3 patients have very bad survival rates, as you see here. It doesn't change if you if we may if we perform a resection or not. So first, as you see, 2,000 years old uh, mantra of uh, medicine is pyramid non necessary. So we shouldn't uh, uh, cause any harm first, and then. Why uh, I am telling that? Because if we do uh, surgery in these patients, N2 and N3 patients, uh, we actually harm the patients because there is no uh, beneficial effect of surgery. In addition, uh, there is a mortality and morbidity rates, which are not, of course, high, but uh, it should be zero uh, in order to be justified. So if it, since it is not zero, we shouldn't operate these patients. So N factor, N from N0 to N3, NX, NX means lymph nodes cannot be assessed. It means there is no lymph node assessment. N0 means there is no lymph nodes involved. N1 denotes the metastasis to ipsilateral peribronchial or ipsilateral hyalur lymph nodes. N2 means that uh, metastasis to ipsilateral mediastinal or subcarinal lymph nodes. We uh, call the patient as N3 when there is a ipsilateral supraclavicular lymph node metastasis or ipsilateral scallion lymph nodes metastasis or contralateral lymph nodes, hyalur or mediastinal. Let me show you the mediastinal lymph nodes. As you see here, it starts from one to uh, it ends to uh, 14. So from one to nine, these are mediastinal lymph nodes. From 10 to 14, these are uh, hyalur and intralobar, inter, in, 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 intrapulmonary lymph nodes, as you see here. This is a clearer uh, picture in order to understand uh, the location of the lymph nodes. 
the, uh, the previous uh, slide is more realistic actually, but this is clearer. So from one to nine, uh, these uh, leaf nodes are mediastinal. It means that if it is positive, uh, ipsilaterally positive, it is called uh, N2. N1 leaf nodes is numbered from 10 to 14. 10 is higher, 11 is interlobar, as you see here. At 12 is lower, 13 is segmental, 14 is subsegmental. You don't have to memorize all of them. Uh, actually, please know that from one to nine, number one to nine, these are uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. From 10 to 14, uh, these lymph nodes are N1 lymph nodes, which means that if they are positive, the patient is staged as N1, of course, ipsilaterally. If uh, it is uh, involved, uh, one of them is involved contralaterally, uh, the patient should be staged as N3. So this is more clear, uh, uh, focused uh, 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 picture, illustration. This is number two, uh, upper paratracheal, four, uh, lower paratracheal, 10, higher, as you see. So let's look at the examples of N0, N1, N2, and N3. N3. So this, uh, the left side of the slide shows a patient with N0 disease. Uh, as you see, there is a right lower lobe tumor, but there is no invasion of the tumor. There is no metastasis uh, in the lymph nodes, uh, interlobal or hyalur lymph nodes. Of course, there are lymph nodes. Uh, usually we have lymph nodes, approximately we have 4,000 lymph nodes in our body. Uh, 1,000 of them are located in the pulmonary system, uh, around or inside the pulmonary system. Uh, but they, these are uh, tumor-free lymph nodes, normal uh, lymph nodes. Usually the size should be low, uh, smaller than uh, uh, 0 0.8 uh, centimeter. And one lymph nodes means there is a tumor, in this case, in the left lower lobe. But uh, the, uh, there are higher leaf nodes, positive higher leaf nodes, as you see. N2 leaf node means there is a tumor with paratracheal, this is lower paratracheal, number four, or uh, subcarinal leaf nodes. Subcarinal leaf nodes are N2 for uh, either sides. Uh, again, uh, this, there is a uh, left lower lobe tumor with uh, subcarinal positive leaf nodes and the uh, ipsilateral uh, paratracheal lymph nodes. It doesn't make any difference if there is a, a, a N1 lymph node positivity. Uh, I mean, if there is a, a mediastinal lymph node positivity, it is called N2. What about N3? In this uh, example, there is a uh, left lower lobe tumor, but there is a higher positive, high, uh, contralateral higher positive lymph nodes or paratracheal lymph nodes, positive lymph nodes. It means this patient has N3 disease. Remember that N3 and N2 patients are not amenable to, for surgery. Or if there is a supraclavicular, supraclavicular or, uh, uh, or uh, scallion lymph node positive, uh, even if there are uh, ipsilateral lymph nodes, the patient should be staged as N3. What about the survival rates? It begins with 92%. Remember the, uh, the graph according to T factor, to, as you see, 0% for stage 4B. Of course, uh, the operable patients are uh, the patients who have uh, the stage uh, of 1A to 3A. So these are the operable patients. Why? Because uh, these five-year survival rates are approximately uh, at least 30%, from 92% to 26%. So it means that these patients can have beneficial effect from surgery. Other patients do not. So how can we evaluate the end factor? Of course, PET-CT is very useful. 
and also there are minimally invasive method, endoscopic ultrasonography or transbronchial needle aspiration, EBUS TTNA, uh, video mediastinoscopy, VAMLA, video assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy, which is gold standard, video mediastinoscopy is gold standard. Mediastinotomy is uh, performed for left, uh, left upper lobe tumors, left uh, with uh, articopulmonary or uh, periaortic leaf node positivity. Extended mediastinoscopy is designed for biopsying from uh, articopulmonary or periaortic lymph nodes. And also video assisted, there is video assisted thoracoscopic surgery for the mediastinal lymph node biopsy. Today uh, in, at operation theater, we, per, we will perform video assisted thoracoscopic surgery uh, in a patient with uh, left sided tumor and the lymph node. So as you, as you know, positron emission tomography is a uh, nuclear method, but for analogy, uh, the atom is so empty that uh, it is like an orange just in the middle of the football field. This is so empty. So Brian Cox, who is a, a physicist, a British physicist, uh, used an analogy that if you uh, extract uh, spaces uh, of 7 billion people uh, who live in the world, you can uh, fit into one sugar cube. So we are so empty, the atoms are so empty. This is why we cannot rely on PET CT on uh, leaf node evaluation. For example, this is a 41 year old female. PET CT shows that hilar leaf node metastasis is present in this patient but mediastinoscopy revealed uh, multiple N2 disease at subcarinal number seven and lower right paratracheal lymph nodes, 4R. So why? Because of the subatomic physics that I talked about. Uh, this shows hilar lymph nodes. However, the signal comes from subcarinal space, not from hilar. hilar. And uh, why it is called hilar? Because of the travel distance of the positrons. Uh, another example, 75, one year old female, PET CT shows 4R and seven, uh, leaf, uh, number seven leaf node metastasis, but mediastinoscopy revealed no leaf node metastasis. Why? Because this positivity comes from non-specific uh, uh, glucose uptake which can be, which can occur because of the uh, tuberculosis infection or non-specific infection or anthracosis or any other benign situation which are not related to uh, tumor. So uh, as summary, a positive predictive value of PET-CT is about 60%, like a tossing a coin. It doesn't mean anything. This is why if PET-CT shows a positive lymph node, we do uh, biopsy, mediastinal lymph node biopsy. A negative predictive value is about 75%. Not bad, but it is not uh, enough. It is not adequate. Uh, so in T1 tumors, it is so accurate. So we rely on uh, PET-CT only in only T1 tumors, peripheral, tumors uh, with uh, smaller than one centimeter lymph nodes without F FDG ability. For other tumors, we do uh, nodal staging. How can we do nodal staging? I talked about EBUS tDNA, endobronch endobronchial ultrasonography, transbronchial needle aspiration. It is basically, fundamentally, it is a, a fiber optic bronchoscopy, but it contains, uh, it consists uh, 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 ultrasonography on the tip of the bronchoscope, and there is a channel for a, a fine needle. So bronchoscopists can see the, uh, the lymph node and uh, they can uh, take biopsy from the lymph nodes, as you see here. It is a non-invasive method, uh, but it is not perfect. Mediastinoscopy is almost perfect. 
It begins with a cervical incision, as you see here. And then uh, we put a mediastinoscope inside the peri uh, peritracheal space, as you see here. We use our fingers to make the dissection. And then we uh, insert the video mediastinoscopes. We used to use uh, normal uh, mediastinoscopes, but nowadays we use uh, video mediastinoscopes. So we insert the video mediastinoscope and we take the lymph nodes out. Actually, we do uh, video assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy, VAMLA for short. It means that we don't uh, only take biopsies from the mediastinal lymph nodes as shown here. We take whole lymph nodes in, in these stations, as, as you see here, 7, 4R, 2L, 2R, 2L, and 4L. So we uh, published the, uh, the importance of the video-assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy, and we were able to show that these patients have higher survival rate uh, if VAMLA is performed before the resection. So in order to give you uh, an, uh, an idea, I want to show you the video clip of uh, video-assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy. This is trachea, as you see here. This is dissection. And then these are uh, mediastinal lymph nodes, these uh, black dots, black lesions. These are antrocotic lymph nodes. Uh, black uh, uh, color comes from uh, hydrocarbons uh, coming from cigarette smoking. Uh, this is carina, right upper, right and left uh, main bronchus. So after the uh, completion of the uh, video assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy, we should see right and left main bronchi very clearly without any leaf nodes. This shows, uh, yes, this is esophagus. This is left main bronchus. This is right main bronchus. This is pulmonary artery. This area, this subcarinal area is totally cleared. This is esophagus because it lies uh, down uh, the subcarinal area. So this is uh, main pulmonary artery just uh, above the carina. So uh, is mediastinoscopy safe? You, you would ask. The answer is yes, uh, it is safe. Uh, this data uh, is extracted from more than 1,200 uh, mediastinoscopies. Actually, uh, the number is now about 2,000. Uh, morbidity is uh, about 2.6, owing to usually dysphonia because of the laryngeal uh, recurrent nerve paralysis. Mortality is so low, we, we didn't see any mortality for at least 13 years. Accuracy is so high, 95. Compare this with the accuracy of PET-CT, which is 75%. So I have, yes, I have talked about this. What about uh, number five and number six lymph nodes, para-aortic and subaortic lymph nodes? There is a, another procedure, uh, which is called anterior mediastinotomy, because we cannot reach these areas with mediastinoscopy. Uh, this is an appropriate technique to approach masses settled in the mediastinum, especially the ones settled in the orthopedical pulmonary window, because uh, as you may uh, uh, notice, this area is not paratracheal area, which can be uh, reached by uh, mediastinoscopy. So it starts with uh, a small incision uh, just onto the second rib, we remove the rib, and this is uh, subaortic lymph nodes, pulmonary artery. And then we resect the subaortic lymph nodes and the periaortic lymph nodes. We do this operation actually for only the left sided tumors with uh, larger or PET positive lymph nodes uh, in these uh, locations, number six and number five locations. Uh, sometimes we use extended mediastinoscopy. It is the method to reach uh, subaortic and periaortic lymph nodes through the mediastinoscopic incision, as you see here. It is a little bit uh, technically demanding uh, operation, 
but we do this operation in selected patients. For example, this patient uh, had uh, anterior mediastinotomy because of the positive lymph nodes in the uh, uh, periaortic area, left-sided tumor. I have shown you this tumor uh, and this again tumor. Uh, the, the, in, in this patient, there was a positive number six and number five lymph nodes. What about video thoracoscopy? Video thoracoscopy is an endoscopic procedure. I will talk about video thoracoscopy in detail in uh, five minutes. Uh, and it is possible to reach almost all uh, ipsilateral lymph nodes with this because uh, the uh, thoracic cavity is reachable by this method. This is a, a lymph node dissection uh, done by video thoracoscopy. This is a, a coagulation. Uh, yes, this is, co uh, yeah. And then it is possible to resect as you see this is paratracheal area. This is right uh, hemithoracic cavity. This is number four. After the opening the uh, mediastinal pleura, it is possible to reach the lymph nodes around here. This is azygous vein. This vein is superior vena cava. And this is trachea. You see, this is trachea. These are paratracheal lymph nodes. So uh, there is a ESTS guidelines, a, a European guidelines. Uh, I was one of the one one one, one of the members of the team, and uh, we uh, created a, a, a flowchart uh, for the mediastinal uh, leaf node evaluation. As you see here, almost all patients should uh, undergo EBUS uh, or mediastinoscopy, VAM stands for video assisted mediastinoscopy. If the mediastinal lymph nodes are positive, the patient should be referred to multimodality treatment. Uh, it means the patient should undergo uh, chemo and or radiotherapy before the operation. What about metastasis? Lastly, I want to talk about metastasis with only one slide. In summary, we operate M0 patients. It means there is no metastasis. M1A means intrathoracic metastasis. M1B is used for single extrathoracic metastasis. And M1C is uh, uh, designated for multiple extrathoracic metastases. So we do only pay, uh, operation in M0. There is one exception that I will talk about. Buraya kadar sormak istediğiniz var mı? Peki. I want to give you some uh, tumor examples of tumors. This is a right lower lobe tumor we operated on. This is, um, uh, I, I have shown this uh, patient with uh, the tumor uh, invading uh, diaphragm. This is a right lower lobe tumor just uh, obstructing the right lower lobe bronchus. We, op we operated on this patient. This patient had a, a, right, a left upper lobe tumor invading the, uh, uh, the fissure. We performed pneumonectomy in this patient. This is right upper lobe tumor, as you see here. Uh, we operated on this patient. So, so how can we decide the, the surgery. Of course, cell type is important, non-small cell lung cancer. T1 to T4 N0, M0 patients are operable. Patient's physical condition, pulmonary reserve, cardiopulmonary reserve, assessment of additional diseases should be done in these patients. So this is a, a summary slide for the evaluation. Uh, if there is no metastasis, it, 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 the patient is N0. Uh, the patient uh, should be evaluated in terms of T factor. If the patient has T1 to T4 tumor, mediastinoscopy should be performed. In possible, if possible, the EBUS tBNA should be done before mediastinoscopy because it is less invasive method. 
the accuracy is lower, but if the positive lymph node is found positive, we stop there and then we send the patient to chemoradiotherapy. If there is a limited N2 disease, we send the patient to neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. Some uh, centers uh, prefer chemotherapy, we prefer chemoradiotherapy. If the mediastinoscopy reveals no lymph node positivity, we do operation. I mean, in zero patients, by definition, uh, is uh, 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 un undergo operation. But if the patient has found, uh, was found to be N1, the operation is okay for them. If there is a bulky N2, it means if there is a multiple N2 or multiple uh, or N3 uh, disease, this patient is deemed to be inoperable. Again, extensive T4 means uh, uh, tumor invading uh, aorta. Uh, again, is inoperable. But there is one exception I talked about. If there is solitary brain or adrenal metastasis, and if the patient has N0 disease, this, uh, and if the brain or adrenal metastasis can be removable, can be operable, we do resection. But first, adrenalectomy is performed, and then we do resection in these patients. Okay. There is a, a term such as solitary pulmonary nodule. If we come across one nodule, uh, we should look at the radiological characters, size, speculation, the uh, location. Uh, and if the size is larger than two centimeter, if the, the tumor is speculated or in the upper low, uh, the uh, likelihood of having tumor, the lung tumor, the malignancy is higher in these patients. Also, age is important and cigarette smoking is important in terms of higher uh, malignancy uh, possibility. So we uh, evaluate the patient in, uh, and if these parameters are positive and some of the parameters are positive, we do uh, transthoracic needle aspiration. Uh, previous malignancy is one of the uh, important parameters. And if the transthoracic needle aspiration is not possible or it is inconclusive, we do batch resection for the nodule. We resect the nodule and send it to the uh, frozen section. Of course, there are many functional evaluation methods and you should know that pulmonary function test is important and FEV1 should be higher than 80% for that patient or post, uh, 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 operative predicted FEV1 should be uh, higher than 40%. But there are other uh, parameters, of course, you don't have to memorize these parameters, such as diffusion lung capacity, artery blood gas analysis, ventilation perfusion scintigraphy, VO2 max in limited uh, in the patients with limited lung function and cardiac evaluation, of course. This shows the guidelines about it, and I skip that. Uh, as I told you before, there are many types of uh, therapeutic options. Uh, surgery is one of them, uh, radiotherapy, traditional chemotherapy, precision therapy, and lastly, immunotherapy uh, uh, are other options. Uh, as you know, in 2019, uh, because of the discovery of the revolutionary uh, immunotherapy, uh, Paul Ellison from MD Anderson and Tosuko Honjo from Japan uh, received a uh, uh, Nobel Prize. And immunotherapy uh, has become one of the most important therapeutic options, but yet surgery is the most uh, effective one. In spite of the developments and radiotherapy, chemotherapy, treatment of uh, choice is lung cancer, in lung cancer is surgery. In small cell lung cancer, as I told you before, uh, it is not primary treatment because they usually are presented with metastasis. Neoadjuvant therapy is performed for N2 disease, single station, or sometimes T4 disease. For example, this is an initial CT of one patient with T4 disease. After neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, uh, the, and this patient had a N2 disease before the surgery, we performed a lobectomy in this patient. What do we do? We used to do thoracotomy. In some patients, we still do uh, perform thoracotomy here, as you see. But during the uh, uh, last years, last uh, 30 years, uh, surgeons, 
thoracic surgeons uh, uh, sought a less invasive method to perform surgeries. Uh, thoracotomy is very standard state-of-the-art procedure to reach the, the thorax, but the incision is so large and the, uh, the damage, the collateral damage to the patient is a little bit higher. So in 1990s, uh, a less invasive method called video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery uh, was invented, as you see here. It starts with five incisions, and then it uh, now, uh, after 2015, at our institution, we do uniportal back surgery. It means that we only use a uh, four centimeter long incision, and we insert our all uh, instruments into one incision. So as you may have guessed, uh, the uh, morbidity, mortality, and the complication rates are lower compared to those of uh, thoracotomy. And also hospital stay is shorter. So we do lobectomy in, uh, in uh, almost all patients in smaller tumors. What about, uh, what, what is lobectomy? Lobectomy is a section of one lobe, as you see here, uh, plus mediastinal lymph node dissection should be performed. Uh, bilobectomy is a modification of standard lobectomy. It is performed in cases which partial or total interlobal invasion with the tumor is present. This is also a resected specimen. CD lobectomy is a modification of lobectomy. It is a surgical procedure. Uh, if the tumor is invading main bronchus and the uh, outside of the lower bronchus, we resect the bronchus with the lobe, of course, and we anastomose the, uh, the remaining bronchus with the main bronchus. This is three lobectomy. Uh, for example, uh, this is left lower sleeve lobectomy. It shows left lower lobe sleeve lobectomy because the tumor invades the lower lobe. It, uh, it is a lower lobe tumor, left lower lobe tumor, but it invades the secondary crina and also main bronchus. Instead of performing a pneumonectomy, this is another option. We do, we can do uh, uh, lobectomy with the resection of the secondary crina, and we do uh, anastomosis of the upper lobe to the main bronchus. There are many types of sleeve lobectomy, upper lobe, lower lobe, if you are uh, curious about that. And then uh, it, is, uh, it shows the intraoperative uh, pictures of this sleeve lobectomy. If we have to, we do pneumonectomy. If sleeve lobectomy is not possible or not probable, if the tumor invades main pulmonary artery, main bronchus, or the major fissure, uh, we do pneumonectomy. Pneumonectomy is resection of whole lung. We don't call it total pneumonectomy. Pneumonectomy denotes the operation of resection of whole lung. And in some patients, if the patient has decreased pulmonary reserve, we do segmentectomy. For even small tumors, we perform lobectomy because it is oncologically acceptable operation uh, because it uh, provides, uh, uh, provides the patient's lower recurrence and higher survival rate. But in, if the patient has very limited uh, lung function, we sometimes do segmentectomy plus lymph node dissection uh, as an alternative to uh, lobectomy, but we do only small number of patients. And there is wedge resection. Wedge resection, as I uh, showed you before, can be performed on patients that are not suitable for even segmentectomy. And if the patient has small masses, it is not oncologically acceptable uh, it, is, it has very limited role, role in oncological surgery, but it can be done for biopsy. Wedge resection is a, a resection of tumor with the healthy, some healthy uh, lung tissue. Uh, as I uh, uh, showed you the extended pulmonary resections, uh, pulmonary resections is uh, extended tumor invasion, the resection of uh, tumor uh, extended to some other uh, adjacent structures. 
ch like like chest wall, diaphragm, left atrium, superior vena cava, or superior sulcus. Uh, speaking of superior sulcus, superior sulcus is a specific tumor. I want to uh, talk about uh, superior sulcus tumors uh, very briefly. Uh, any primary lung cancer presenting with constant pain, uh, meiosis, ptosis, and ophthalmia can be seen in these patients because of the invasion of the brachial flexus. Uh, of course, uh, we have to know that if the patient has N0 disease, because if the patient has N2 disease, the patient is uh, inoperable. Uh, remember the, the lymph node uh, staging procedures and the uh, the flow chart. Uh, we use uh, MRI to understand the extension of the superior sulcus more clearly. Uh, it is uh, it shows the the uh, invasion of the superior sulcus tumors. We use usually thoracotomy uh, because there are truncus trunchi bron bronchial trunchi. We can resect one truncus or the other truncus because. As you know, in the other parts of the body, when you cut one uh, nerve, you cut one uh, motor and the sensory uh, fibers of one nerve. But as you know, from C5 to T1, uh, the nerves uh, are conjured and, and come together to form a, a trunchi, bronch bronchial truncus, trunchi. So there are three uh, tronchi, uh, bron bronchial tronchi, and we can resect one or two of them. And the patient can use uh, his or her arm after the surgery because other, the other uh, remaining trun truncus can contain other uh, fibers, the fibers from other nerves. So we uh, resect one or uh, two, sometimes three, uh, uh, ribs with the resection uh, of uh, the lobe. So multidisciplinary team is very, very important. Uh, in multidisciplinary team should decide which patient to operate or which patient to, to, uh, to have uh, chemoradiotherapy. Every Wednesday uh, between uh, uh, half past 12, and half past one, uh, we come together with uh, pulmonary physicians, colleagues, uh, with pathologists, uh, nuclear uh, medicine uh, specialists, uh, and the, uh, the uh, faculty members, uh, radiologists. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, participate this multidisciplinary team. Uh, now, nowadays, we uh, come together on uh, Zoom, of course, and we decide every patient, we uh, discuss every patient uh, about the uh, possible uh, therapies. So future therapies are various, uh, but there, are, there is a time for future therapies, such as uh, uh, very effective uh, targeted therapies. There are many targeted therapies, but they are far from perfection. Evet. Var mı burada sorunuz? I want to talk about uh, the importance of screening in uh, a couple of slides. Uh, it will take only three minutes. Uh, actually, as I told you, um, many patients, unfortunately, have no symptoms or signs. And uh, for this reason, as I told you, many patients are diagnosed with very large tumors. Uh, most of them have uh, non-operable tumors. So the question is, should we implement a screening program in some high-risk population? Uh, the answer was yes. This, uh, there are two main articles, very nice uh, state-of-the-art articles about that. Uh, uh, and uh, two of them are randomized trials. One of them was published in 2011. 
and they randomized more than 63,000 uh, people uh, who are uh, at high risk of having lung cancer. These uh, people are the people who, uh, who are older than 55 years old, uh, but uh, younger than seven, 74 years old, and they smoked more than 30 pack year of cigarette. And uh, they uh, randomized these people into two arms. One arm received low dose CT every year, annual CT. The other group, uh, which consisted more than 26,000 uh, uh, people uh, received only radiography. And they found that uh, the uh, uh, CT uh, screen uh, people had higher uh, survival rate and there were more tumors discovered in this group. Also, there is a Nelson study which, which was published in 2020. This is a European study. And European study showed that definitely uh, the screening, uh, screening in, uh, is important in these patients. Uh, uh, the first results were presented in 2018 in Toronto, and it was published in 2020. As you see here, uh, uh, screening can could increase survival rate 25% in males, but 60% in females, which is huge. So uh, now, unfortunately in Turkey, this is not a standard method. This is not a standard methodology for, uh, uh, that is not accepted by the uh, government, by the Minister of Health, because five, uh, uh, societies uh, in Turkey presented a, a proposal to the Minister of Health approximately seven years ago, but they didn't uh, accept the proposal. But uh, I recommend you to recommend uh, chest CT for your relatives or your future patients uh, for screening, uh, actually, because it provides higher survival rate and it provides the diagnosis of earlier patients with lung cancer. Evet. Sorularınız